Hey there folks, welcome back from module 5 of the CompTIA A plus course. This module is called Configuring Network Addressing. On that note, this module is clearly going to be about, well, IP addresses. All kinds of IP addresses to be exact. We're going to learn today about public IPs, private IPs, dynamic IPs, static IPs and much, much more. So, let us have a quick peek at the agenda. That would be basic TCP IP concepts. That's going to be the first section we're going to be looking at. The second section we'll be diving into will be compare network configuration concepts. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but trust me, that's a lot of nonsense we have to go and talk about. Speaking of nonsense, if you guys haven't done it already, please boink that like button. That's one way you guys can show me support you know, since this is all for free. And if you'd like to know when module 6 of A plus comes out or well any of my other videos then remember to also subscribe otherwise you might miss it all right so that's my selfless promotion and now i believe we can jump into that first main section which is basic tcp ip concepts i know the name sounds fancy but that's comped here for you so if it was up to me i would have chosen a different name so in this section the first topic we're going to dive into is well you've guessed it ip addresses folks so what can we say about an IP address? So for those of you that's entirely new to IT or IP addressing at least, that is basically your device's address for lack of a better description. So if you guys wanted to invite me to your house for let's say a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, how would I come to your house? You would have to give me an address if you think about it. So you're gonna have to tell me which country you're in, you know, maybe which subsection, what region, what town, what street, house number, possibly you're staying in a complex, so I'm gonna have to know a unit number, you know, that kinds of stuff. And eventually I'm gonna end up at your house, I'm gonna come and knock on your door and I'm gonna come and take you up on that offer for a cup of coffee or whatever this might be. Now machines work in much of the same way. IP addresses, you can think of them as an address from one machine to another. So if one machine wants to communicate to another, IP addresses is for the most part they're what they will go and use to do that. You get many kinds of IP addresses, but that's something we'll get to shortly later in this very same module. Now there is a bit of an IP address example for you guys, completely random one with no significance. So that's 192.168.0.15, no significance to that. So we're gonna show you guys how to go and configure these things as well, in case any of you guys I have no idea how I'd go and do that. Don't worry, we'll show you guys. So the first thing we want to talk about when it comes to IP addresses is how many bits does an IP address consist of? If you look at the one I've given you guys there, that first of all is an IP version 4 address. And now if you guys don't know, you actually get more than one kind of version. You get a version 4 and you get version 6. We're mostly going to be focusing on version 4 and A+. Version 6 is generally only something you need to know from N+, territory. If any of you folks plan on taking up N+, and sitting for that exam, you definitely need to go and clue yourself up on version 6 as well. For now, if version 4 is something you understand, then, well, great. You're on the right path. So keeping it to version 4, the one we have there is a version 4 address. It consists of 32 bits. For those of you that's curious, version 6 consists of 128 bits. Not that we need to know that at this point in time. So when we say 32 bits, what do we mean by that? It's 32 binary digits. 32 ones and zeros. A 1 means something is on. A 0 means something is off. Now there is a bit of an example for you guys of a binary number or a binary version of an IP address. Would you guys believe me if I told you that that binary number that I've written there in green, that ones and zeros, is in fact the same IP address? Yes, that's right, folks. So you can actually go and convert IPs, you know, the decimal form of an IP address, to the binary form, which is what I've done there, and you can do it vice versa. There's probably like 20 different ways you can go and do that, and none of them is right or wrong. They're actually all right, you know, so it's just going to come down to personal preference. Which one do you prefer to go and use? which one is easier and quicker for you. What works for me will not necessarily work for you guys. So if you guys would like to know more about how to go about converting these IP addresses from decimal to binary and vice versa, I'm gonna include a link in the video description down below to one of the N plus videos I've done for the latest N plus course, because that's obviously a little bit more advanced. And in that video, you'll see I show you in great detail how to go and convert this and um, oh, hell, I'll even go and include a couple of other links to other videos of N+, in that description. Not all of them, 
just the ones that I feel is related to this specific module of A+. So maybe I'll include a video there about IP addresses in general, subnetting for those of you that know what subnetting is. That's the kind of stuff you will find in the video description down below. Okay. Another thing I want to mention to you guys is an IP address actually consists of four octets. Now, what is meant by that? Well, there's four digits. So we go check. There's a 192 dot. So that 192 is an octet. The 168 is an octet. The zero is an octet. And the last one there being the 15, that is an octet. So there's four octets there. So that's what's meant by the octets. These IP addresses can be converted from decimal to binary and vice versa, like we've said. And to help you guys understand that, for those of you that's curious or for those of you that needs to know that for the M plus exam, the link will be in the video description down below. All right, so let's move on to our next topic of IP addresses. That would be public and private IP addresses. Okay, so for those of you completely brand spanking new to this, a public IP address is a routable one across the internet. That is the kind of IP address you or someone would have when you go online and when you browse the internet to do whatever it is you guys do on the internet. Um, a private IP address, those are restricted to local networks. So that's the kind of IP address you or the user would have inside your home, inside your office, whether it's a small office or big office, doesn't matter. That's the kind of IP address you would have inside the building, in other words. So whenever you're inside the building on that private network, that is called a private network, and the IP addresses you have on that network are private IP addresses. As soon as you go through the router, or router, depending on which country you're from, you might pronounce that differently. Some countries pronounce it as router, some pronounce it as router. So as soon as you go through the router out to the internet, then you have a public IP address, guys. That is the one we use to trace you. So if you ever get up to something naughty online, um, that is the one I'm going to trace you of. I'm going to trace you to the nearest router. I'm not going to know exactly where you are in that building. So if that building has a couple of hundred people in it, no, I'm not going to know where you are in that building. I'm only going to be able to trace you to that router. And if there's a couple of hundred people in that building, then, well, it's not really going to help me now, is it? Um, so from there, I'm going to have to contact that company, contact the administrators of that company, and ask them to go and check on a firewall or something, who is the person that's up to shenanigans. Um, but from the outside, there's not much you can do besides tracing someone to that router, guys. That public IP address, just FYI, is the same IP address you would see on certain websites. If you go online to some sites, you'll find some websites are very tight in the security and they will try and recommend to you to go and use some sort of VPN or this or that to, you know, basically protect you, you know. And when it comes to that, you'll find the IP address they show you there is in fact your public IP address. So they're not lying to you when they tell you you are exposed on the internet and that you should go and use a VPN of sorts. They're not lying to you. That part is actually true. Now, when it comes to these private IP addresses that you'll have inside your network, behind the router, there's different kinds you get, folks. You get class A, class B, and class C. So here is an example of a class C IP address, which is probably the most common kind of IP address you'll get. Um, the majority of class C IP addresses will start off 192.168.0.something. That last zero will be dot something else. We can ignore the slash 24 for now. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, and there is the subnet mask in green. So if you were to go and get yourself a class C IP address, or if you go and type it in manually, you'll find your subnet mask will normally be, normally be the default triple two five five dot zero. Now, if you guys don't know what a subnet mask is, that basically determines how big your network is in the sense of, you know, how many networks you've got, how many available IP addresses it's got. How many times has been subdivided? Yep, there's a lot of things that, that that subnet mask tells us. And believe it or not, that zero at the back doesn't have to be a zero. So as long as it's a triple two five five in the front, that tells us we're dealing with a class C network. And the zero at the back can now be swapped with a couple of other numbers that we will show you in another video. So I'm going to link that in the video description down below where I've explained that in an N plus video because that's N plus territory. So if you guys are curious what subnetting is, how to subnet a network, why we do that, how we do that, all that kinds of stuff, go check that video in the video description down below, and that'll obviously explain everything you need to know. 
Now, as for the 24 that's behind the IP address, that basically just tells us what the subnet mask is. So if it's a slash 24, it tells us it's the normal default 22.55.0. If that 24 was something else, that 22255 would be something else. Now, here is another private IP address for you guys. This is a 172.16.something.something. That is normally class B IP addresses. A class B subnet looks like this 255, 255, and then 00. zero. So instead of triple 255, it's just double 255. As soon as the subnet mask is double 255, it doesn't matter what the, the digits behind the 255 is, as long as the two front ones are 255, in other words, to do the two first octets, that tells us we're dealing with a class B IP address. The last one I've got here for you guys, there's a third one, that is an example for class A IP address. And a class A IP address, you can probably guess what that subnet's going to look like. It's just one 255 in the front. The last three octets doesn't matter. Now, those IP addresses I've just given you guys there, the 192, the 172, the 10, those are normally what they are. So that's normally class C, the first one. The second one is normally class B. The last one is normally class A. That's not set in stone, though, folks. There has been many cases where I've seen a 172.16 be a class C IP address. At the end of the day, it's determined by the subnet mask. So if I really want to, I can go and make my IP or your IP 172.16.something.something and just make absolutely sure the subnet mask is triple two five five dot something. That would then mean that IP address is a class C IP address because it's determined by the subnet mask. But assuming I have not manually forced it like that, the 192 will normally be considered class C, the 172 would normally be considered class B, and the 10 would normally be considered class A. It's very important you guys remember that for this exam. In the exam, you guys are going to be expected to understand and know IP addresses. You need to know what an IP address is. You need to know what a public and a private IP address is. You need to be able to identify the two. And when it comes to private IP addresses, you need to be able to identify the different kinds we get, which is the three I just listed there for you guys. You guys are going to have to be able to identify static versus dynamic IP addresses. Static are also known as manual or fixed IP addresses. Um, the dynamic ones are sometimes known as DHCP IP addresses, but it's basically the same thing. You're also going to be able to have to identify or understand what an APIPA IP address is. And then lastly, folks, you also need to know what a loopback IP address is. Um, I think just to help you guys understand that it's not actually part of this module, but let me just list it here on the screen for you guys, so that you can, go, for those of you that's making notes that want to go write the exam. I know it's not part of the module, but I notice a lot of you guys need to write the exam, and my purpose here is to get everybody to pass this freaking exams. So on the right here, let me just quickly recap for those of you that's taking notes. You need to know what an IP address is. You need to know what a public IP and a private IP address is. You need to be able to um, differentiate between the two and identify the two. Within the section or category of private IP addresses, you need to be able to identify class A, B, and C, which is the three on the screen. They're on the left and blue. And um, you need to be able to identify a fixed IP address versus a dynamic IP address. What's the difference between those two and all that kinds of jazz. And then lastly, you need to be able to, uh, be able to explain and identify a PIP IP address and a loopback IP address. So there you have it, folks. Now, on that note, let's move on to the next topic here of IP addresses, which is static versus dynamic IP addresses. So the very first one here is static IP address. I've mentioned it before and I'll mention it again in this module. Static IP addresses are also known as a fixed IP address or alternatively a manual IP address. Now what that means is you or the user or the client will go and configure an IP address for something. This is probably going to be a laptop or a desktop, but in reality it can be anything. You're going to go and configure an IP address for something. This will be done manually and that device's IP address will stay like that until you or someone goes into that device manually one day and manually turn it back off you know, to dynamic or manually go and change the freaking IP address. Other than that, it will never change. That's what they mean by fixed or static IP address. Then you get something called a dynamic IP address. And this is actually what most companies go and use. Um, sometimes referred to as a DHCP address or IP address, but I think it's more commonly known as a dynamic IP address. So that means the device does not have an IP address. This is the default setting for most devices, not just laptops and desktops, guys. 
This also applies to tablets, phones, access points, routers, you name it. Everything is on dynamic in the beginning until you or someone goes and changes it. Now let's keep it to something simple. Let's say this is a laptop or a desktop. As soon as you take that laptop or that desktop and you connect it to a network via cable or you connect it to the company's Wi-Fi connection, as soon as you do that, that device is going to go and request an IP address. Yep, request. It's going to say, hey, I am here. My name is blah, blah, blah. I would like an IP address. Is there anyone out there? Is there a DHCP out there? And if there is a DHCP on the network, this could be built into the router if it's a small network, or it could be a legit big server if it's a medium-sized or a large-sized company. Point is, if there's a DHCP on a network, it will respond and say, yes, I am here. How can I assist you? And then the machine is going to say, okay, well, I need an IP address. Can you help me out? DHCP will reply and say, yes, my bra. Um, how about the following? And it would basically offer a random IP address that's within their, within their scope or within the range. It's going to offer your machine an IP address. Your machine is going to say, okay, cool. I like that one. I will take it. Kind of like window shopping. And then the server is going to say, okay, cool. If you're going to take that one, here you go. And it's going to hand it out to that machine. And your machine will have an IP address for an X amount of time. Because these IP addresses have got leases associated with them, which means they expire after a certain period of time. And when that happens, it will cease to function and you will have to either release it and get a new one or just renew the IP address to begin with. Something we're still getting to, which is going to be in the second main section in this module. Now, still on the topic of dynamic IP addresses, if your machine or your client's machine is unable to get an IP address, a dynamic one, for whatever reason, this could be something as simple as the cable is plugged out. This could be something like maybe you're out of range of the frequency. You, you know, you, you're not in range of the Wi-Fi frequency. Maybe there is no IP addresses left. Yep, that can actually happen. There's a certain amount available and once they're up, they're up. Whatever the reason might be, the point here is if the machine is unable to get an IP address, what actually happens then? Well, folks, that is something we call a PIPA, which is something you need to know for the exam. Expect no less than three questions about this in your exams. You need to know what a PIPA is. You need to be able to identify what an PIPA address looks like. So there's going to be some questions in the exam. You may or may not get them. And they'll say, which of the following is an example of an PIPA IP address? They will present you a four possible IPs. And one of them is going to be a PIPA one. And I'll show you guys in a moment what that looks like. And you'll need to identify that. And then maybe a couple of questions later, they'll actually ask you the same question. They'll just go and rephrase it. This is kind of like asking what is 1 plus 2. And then five questions later, I'll ask you what's 2 plus 1. It's technically the same question, but they're asking it in a different manner to see if you've memorized these answers by cheating or if you legit understand it. And my mission, my goal, if you will, here is to make you guys understand this. So and then maybe a couple of questions later, they'll give you an APIPA IP address and they'll say, this is an example of what? And you'll have four possible choices. There's the choices you can expect. There's things like APIPA, loopback IP, private IP, public IP. That's the kind of ones you'll get. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of questions. Just APIPA alone. Expect two to three questions about that. Expect a couple of questions about public and private IP. Expect a couple of questions about fixed and dynamic IPs. And within private IP, expect a couple of questions where you're going to have to identify which one is class A, B, and C. So yeah, you're going to get a lot of IP questions, guys. So clearly, IP addresses is very, very important. All in all, in the exam, you know, you're going to get about between 19 and 100 questions, of which I would estimate between 10 and 15 will be IP address related. So this is about 10 to 15% of your exam. Yes. So this could make you or break you in the exam, in other words. Very, very important. So I apologize if I keep repeating myself on some of these topics, but I cannot emphasize enough on how freaking important this is for the exam if anyone plans on writing the exams. So yeah, I've been bragging about our people. Let me show you what it looks like. That is what it looks like, folks. 169.254.something.something. .something. The last two octets does not matter. So if you were to go and check your IP address, and we'll get to that later where we can show you guys how you go and check your IP address. But if you were to go and check your IP address for yourself or a user or a client, whoever this might be, and you see the IP address is 169.254.something.something. .something .something. At first you might think, oh, okay, this person's got an IP. And no, no, they don't. 
That is not an IP address. You can think of this as a placeholder. That, folks, is a PIPA. So whenever you see that, it means the device in question is unable to get an IP. It does not have an IP. And it's up to you to figure out why the heck that is. This can be for any amount of reasons. So you just need to go and figure that out. So that's that's going to be in your hands to go and figure out why it's got a PIPA. But for the exam, you just need to know that that is a PIPA, of course. So I've done my job there when it comes to that. So folks, let's move on to the second main section within this module. And remember, if you would like to know more about any of these topics, I have included additional resources for you guys in the video description down below. So it's your own fault if you don't use them. Use them, don't use them. Um, I put a lot of effort into this video for you guys to get you guys to pass. And I put a lot of effort into giving you guys additional resources as well, should you need that. So those other videos, I'm not going to lie about it. I'm the one that made those videos as well, because then I know it's done right. Not that I'm bad mouthing anyone else. It's just I don't have the time to go and double check if someone else is explaining a topic correctly or not. So I'm just going to refer to the videos where I know for a fact it is going to cover what needs to be covered. So the second main section here, folks, is compare network configuration concepts. And one of the main things we're going to be talking about in this section is going to be DHCP. We're going to talk about, you know, how IP addresses get issued. I think I might actually show you guys how we do that because that's just going to make this module more interesting. The whole idea is for this information to stick. And what better way to get that to happen than for me to physically show you guys what the heck I'm talking about here. So I think... We'll show you guys how to go and allocate an IP address. We'll show you guys what DHCP is and where you can go and configure it. So I'll log into my router uh, because, you know, DHCP is built into some routers. And then I've got a virtual machine running in the background with server installed. And there I've already installed DHCP. And there we can also show you what DHCP looks like and behaves like on a server. Yep. So on to our first section here within this second module. That would be dynamic host configuration protocol. Now you can probably already guess what that is. It is commonly known as DHCP for short. Now I know not everybody knows what DHCP is, but at the very least, I think any of you guys that's been in IT for a while would have heard of the word DHCP. Um, I kind of accidentally did mention briefly what a DHCP does. So that is something that gives you or your devices an IP address. So if there's a device on the network, doesn't matter if it's wired or wireless, and if that device is configured to obtain an IP address dynamically and not, you know, doesn't have one fixed or manually configured, that device is going to go and ask on a network for an IP address. And if there's a DHCP on the network, which could be either in a router or an actual full-blown server, that DHCP will issue that device with an IP address, assuming, of course, it has got one available in its scope because these IP addresses could actually get used up. You can think of these IP addresses as parkings at the mall. So if you're going to go to the mall at payday or if you're going to go there on Black Friday or Christmas or pretty much any you know holiday where it's really busy at the, at the mall, Good luck finding a parking there, because at that point in time, you're not going to even be bothered trying to get a parking close to the door. You'll just be happy to get any parking, quite frankly. Now, you can think of these parkings at the mall as IP addresses. If there's not a parking and you cannot park your vehicle, you cannot go into the mall and do whatever it is you want to go and do. IP addresses work in the same manner, folks. There's only an X amount available, and once they're up, they are up. You're going to have to sit there and wait and wait and wait, or at least your device is going to have to wait and wait and wait. And then eventually when one of the IP addresses that's now been used gets freed up, yep, that can actually happen, then your device is going to go and grab it up. And essentially you can think of that as getting yourself a parking at the mall when someone vacates a parking. So you might find yourself double parking there somewhere, which is not entirely legal most of the time. And um, eventually when you see someone going to their vehicle, you know, loading their groceries in their car, and as soon as they vacate their parking, immediately go in there as quickly as possible using their parking, which has now just been freed up. IP addresses work in the same manner. So when one of the current devices on the network plugs the cable out, disconnects from the Wi-Fi frequency, or quite frankly just turns itself off, whatever IP address that device held, this could be a laptop, desktop, tablet, phone, whatever. Whatever IP address it held, it gets released back into the pool 
to wherever that might be, router or server, which means it's now available for another device to grab if there is another device in the queue, of course. All right, so as I've just said, this DHCP is a function that is commonly built into most routers. However, it can also be added as an actual role on a server, if you guys know what a role is and what a server is. So when and why would we have this in our routers? Well, pretty much all routers has this these days. It's usually turned on by default. And if you're using this in your home or anyone's home, really, or in a small office, home office, you know, environment, it's probably going to be the router that's going to be issuing IP addresses to devices in that network. But if you start looking at networks, you know, medium to large size companies, there it's probably going to be an actual server, something like a Windows server, and someone like yourself might have added a DHCP role onto that server, and that's going to consist of a couple of things. So just to give you guys an idea of what this will consist of, it's not limited to this list I'm about to give you, but this is the main cheese, the main gist of it. So it consists, of course, of the DHCP scope. So that's, in other words, how many IP addresses are available and where do they start and where do they end. It consists of DHCP leases. So all of the IP addresses that's been issued to devices thus far, how long are they valid for and when will they expire? So the default, I think, with, uh, with a new server probably be about eight days, but no, no company ever makes this eight days. Normally, we'll go and reduce this to, this to about 24 hours for the average company. So if a device has an IP address after 24 hours, if it has not been released, it will still have the IP address, but it will essentially cease to function. Then the DHCP also consists of reservations. So that means there's a certain IP address or maybe multiple ones that are in fact being issued devices, but these IP addresses that are being issued devices will always be issued to the same devices because normally that's not what happens. Normally a random IP, a completely random IP in the scope range will be issued to any device that's requesting one. Now there are cases where a device needs to have the same IP every day over and over. This could be something like a printer. And in those cases, you can go and do something called a reservation. I'll show you guys this is on an actual server in a couple of moments. And then the last one I want to add here, which was actually not part of the course, the first three I've just mentioned is actually the only ones that's part of this course, surprisingly. And yet I feel you need to know the fourth one, which I'm about to list to you guys, that is exclusions. All companies create and use exclusions just as much as reservations. So it's, I don't know, I don't know why it's not included in the course. Don't ask me, ask CompTIA. So it's probably not going to be in the exam if it's not in the course, but you definitely need to know this going out into the field. So we'll throw that into the mix for you guys as well, and we'll also show it to you guys, because why the heck not? We're going to be on a server anyway. So on that note, I'm going to first switch over to a browser in the background, guys. And the reason I want to do that, I'm going to log into a router. I'm going to really do that. I'm not going to show you guys where I actually log on to throughout the, you know, the username and password section for obvious reasons, because I don't want you guys seeing that. And on the main page, I'm not going to show you guys that either, because there it shows my router's MAC address, and there's a lot of weird weasels out there. It's up to no good. So I'm just going to skip ahead to the DHCP section on that router. So let's switch over to that router. Alrighty, folks, here we are in a web browser, already logged in. As you guys can see, I've already gone to the top. I've already typed in the IP address of this device in question. Uh, obviously, this is a router. Once you do that, it's going to take you to a page that looks like a web page, but it's actually just the login page of this device, which is a router. It's going to ask you the username and the password, which I've already provided. And once you've done that, it should take you to kind of like, I think, this tab here, which says status. It's going to show me my router's IP address. That's not the biggest concern because that's a private IP address, so I'm not concerned about that. But it's also going to show you guys the MAC address of this specific device, which is unique in the world. And I don't want people seeing that because they're going to get up to no good when they see that and they're going to try and hack me. So good luck with that. So I've gone ahead or so skipped ahead and I've clicked on the DHCP section, which is the only real section I want to bring you guys attention to. Now, at the moment, it is enabled the DHCP on this router. That is, in fact, the default option. This is the scope. So there's not much we can go and configure when it comes to DHCP on a router. We're actually quite limited. So the scope is from where to where. How many IP addresses will I have? So my range is going to be 192.168.0. And the very first IP address in this 
range, some people call it scopes, will be 100. And it's going to be the exact same thing this side, but the very last IP is going to be 199. So just about 100 to 99, yeah, 99 to 100 IP addresses here. So if any device, it's not necessarily a phone or a, or a tablet, this can be a laptop, desktop, tablet, phone, whatever. If any device connects to this network of mine, you know, however they decide to go and do that, they will get an IP address within that range. Anything between 100 and 199. What that will be, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. It's going to be randomly assigned to that device. And if God forbid I go and connect more than about 100 devices to my network, that's what's going to happen is, well, nothing. That device might just see at the bottom next to the little Wi-Fi bar at the bottom right or the little computer icon. They might just see some sort of notification that says obtaining IP, obtaining IP or no internet connectivity or no internet connectivity. And if you were to go to command prompt, for those of you that's familiar with command prompt, and if you were to go and check your IP address, you would see you've got a PIPA IP address, which means you have no IP address. Remember we said that earlier. So you would see you've got a 169.254, which means you're unable to get an IP address. And in this case, the reason for that would be because, well, there is none available. And then eventually when some other device on network goes and turns itself off, disconnects in some sort of manner, that IP address that it held would be freed up and this device in question would obviously get it. I can, if I really want to, I can go and disable DHCP here, but that's not something I want to do because I'm doing this at my home today. And that would mean nothing in my house is going to work. If this is a small office, a home office or a home, you're probably going to leave that on. Like I said, if this is a medium to large size company, you're more than likely going to turn that off because you're probably going to want to go and add the DHCP role onto a server where you've got more control over it. Now, on that note, I've got a virtual machine idling in the background, and this virtual machine already has Server 2019 installed. So I'm going to switch over to that, and I'm going to show you guys what it actually looks like with DHCP on the server side of things. So switching over. A few moments later. All right, folks, here we are on that virtual machine, which is exactly like a real computer. It's just virtual. Not that you need to know that at this point in time. The point here is it's got server 2019 installed and you can see here we are in the server manager for those of you that's familiar with that you don't need to know that on the left here it shows me which roles have been installed thus far not that it matters the only one we need to focus on right now is the one here it says dhcp so i've already gone through the whole procedure of adding the role here not part of this course but if you're curious how to go and do that i can show you guys in a different course i think i actually have done that in multiple courses so that might have been shown in the n plus course and um, there's a couple of server courses on my channel as well where I've actually shown you guys how to go and do that. So if you want to know how to do that, go check out those videos. So assuming the role has already been added, you can go to the top right hand side here where it says tools. Go click on that. It's going to give you a bunch of options here. One of those options is going to be DHCP. This option will only appear if you've already added a role. So that's essentially going to go ahead and open the DHCP console. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. Opens it up very small here. I'm going to minimize this stuff in the background. I'm going to make this nice and big so you guys can go and see. You can zoom in if need be. You can pause the video if need be. So there is your company's name. So in my case, that's my pretend, pretend name. You know, for same as my YouTube channel, Burning Eyes Tech. I'm going to expand that up. We're going to be talking about IP version 4 today. So that's going to be the only one we're going to focus on today. I'm going to expand that. And that's pretty much as default as things get. It doesn't get more default than that. There's absolutely nothing going on here at this point in time. So the very first thing you will need to do is create yourself one or more scopes, those ranges we talked about. Probably just going to need one in most companies, and here we're just going to do one. How do you do that? You right-click here where it says IP version 4. There's an option here that says new scope. Sounds very fancy, sounds very complicated, but guys, that's actually just the range like we saw on the router. going to click on that. We're going to just go for this little wizard by clicking on next. Give it a name. The name really doesn't matter. So I'm just going to call it test for now. So let's say, I don't know, Burning Ice Tech Scope Test. That's one heck of a long name. Normally we would not advise you to go and do that. Next. Now here you get to go and do pretty much the exact same thing as what we saw on that router earlier. I get to go and specify my range. So just like the router, I can go and make this 192.168.0. And what was the router? I think it started from 100. And here I can go make a 192.168.0 and just like the router, it was 199. It's exactly the same thing. 
If any of you guys are familiar with subnetting and that kinds of jazz, you can go and play with this stuff here at the bottom. That is not the topic today. So that's about 99 to 100 IP addresses. I'm going to go ahead here and click on next. Now, exclusions is one of the topics that was not included in this module, and it's actually not included in A plus all together. I'm adding this for you guys as an extra topic, not because it's going to be an exam. I don't actually expect you guys to get any questions about this in the exam, but I can damn well guarantee you, you will work with this in your work environment at some point in time, sooner or later. And if you don't know what it is, or if you don't know what, how to go and do it, yeah, it might become a bit of a problem. So exclusions is any IP address in that range that we've just specified that you do not want to have dished out. So at the moment, we've got about 99 to 100 IP addresses that will be dished out. And if there happens to be, by some chance, one or more IP addresses in that range that we really do not want to have issued to some sort of device because of whatever reason, most likely because these IP addresses have been statically assigned to something like a server or whatnot, if that's the case, you can go ahead here and exclude those IPs. So in that range from 100 to 199, any and all IPs will be dished out except the ones you've added in your exclusions list. So I can specify my exclusions here on this list right now. I can also go and do it later. If it's one IP address, you're just going to go and type it in there twice. If it's multiple IPs and they follow back to back, you can go and type in the first and the last one there. But if it's multiple IPs, but they do not follow back to back, you're going to have to go and go through the excruciating process of adding them one by one by one. So how do we add one? You're going to go do it like this, 192.168.0, so what was that range of us? 100 to 199. So I'm going to thumb suck it and make it up, let's say the IP we want to exclude today is 115. I mean that's pretty much in the range of between 100 and 199, would you not say? So I'm going to go ahead and type that twice, like so, and that's how you exclude one IP or if you want to go do them one by one. If it's multiple IPs and they follow back to back, you're just going to go and add the last number here of the last one, of course. Click add, and there you go, folks. Next, here we're going to talk about the lease. Remember, the lease is one of those topics. The lease is how long will this IP address be valid for until it is expired. Once it expires, whatever device that still holds that IP address, if it has not been released, that device is not going to be able to connect to the network, and more importantly, it will not be able to connect to the internet or do anything on the internet. It's going to have to plug a cable out and plug it back in, disconnect from the Wi-Fi, reconnect the Wi-Fi, you know, whatever connection it's on, or, you know, just restart. You've probably heard of that famous old IT joke where they say, hey, have you tried turning it off and on again? It's funny because it's true, and it surprisingly fixes a lot of things, guys. One of the things it does is it actually releases your old IP and renews your, and asks for a new one. So that's just one of the many, many things. I'm going to go ahead here and make this a 1. That's basically 24 hours, which you guys not say. Next. I'm going to leave this all for later. That's fine for now. Finish. And there we go, folks. So there is our scope. You'll notice, I know it's very small. You guys probably can't see this without zooming in. But there's actually a little folder icon there. And it's got a little circle there. So for those of you that can't see, it's a little circle. It's got a little arrow, a red arrow, pointing downwards. Now, what does that mean? That means the scope is there, but it is not active yet. More precisely, it has not been activated yet. You need to go and activate the scope first before it's actually going to go and do anything. You can think of this as a safety switch on a weapon. It's not going to actually fire until, well, you go and turn off the safety. So the reason why that is there is, well, I suppose there's actually many reasons for it, but one of the reasons is for testing purposes. So you can go and test something safely in a secure environment without having to worry about it. So if I were to go to this scope, which I've already expanded here, if I click on address pool, it'll show me my current scope. So you can see there is my one and only scope going from 100 to 199. It shows me all my exclusions. At the moment, there is just a freaking one. If you would like to go and add more, you can do that by right clicking here, new exclusion, and just go and add the same IP twice. If it's one, if it's multiple ones, you can go and add the range there. Here we've got address leases. Now mine's blank at the moment because I literally just made this freaking DHCP. But if this is a legit DHCP that's actually in production, you would actually see all IP addresses, which is probably going to be a lot, mind you. You're going to see all IP addresses that has been issued thus far to devices. 
You can see which ones they are. You can see to which device they've been issued, how long they're still valid for, all that. Here is the reservation section. Now, this actually was part of the course. So this is where you'll have the ability to go and reserve certain IPs in that range. They will, in fact, be dished out, but they will always be dished out to the same device over and over and over. You can right click there, new reservation. Here, you're going to type the name of the device in question. So I'm going to thumb suck it and make something up here to give you guys a bit of a scenario. Let's say this is a printer, because that's actually a very good example of why you want to go and do this. Now, if I install a printer on someone's machine right now, that printer is going to have a dynamic IP, and today it's actually going to work perfectly fine. Let's say this printer's got an IP address of dot .120. Now, today when you install it, it's going to have an IP, obviously, of 120. It's going to map it on that computer of that user as 120. So when that user tries to print to that printer, it's going to send the print job to, well, 120. And then tomorrow will eventually come, and the day after that, that printer will have a different IP other than 120 possibly. And if and when that happens, guess what's going to happen when that user clicks on print? That user, when he clicks on print or when she clicks on print, it's going to send that print job to the IP of 120. And guess who's there? Nobody. So what we want to do here is we want to keep that IP for the printer so that when that user clicks on print, and it goes to 120, there needs to always be a printer at 120. That goes without saying, this example I'm giving you guys is not limited to printers, but that's probably one of the best examples to give you guys. So reservation name, I'm going to give it a proper professional name. I'm going to say printer, so that I will know what this is if I come back here after a couple of months. And it's also a professional courtesy amongst other technicians. So if another technician come, comes here, they will know what this reservation was for. Now, if this company happens to have many printers in different locations, you might be want to be more precise than just saying printer. So this is reception. I might say printer at, well, reception. Let's go and add the IP address in question. The only thing that's left here for you to go and do is to go and add the MAC address of this device. Any and pretty much all devices that can connect to a network has IP addresses and they've got MAC addresses. These MAC addresses are unique. You can think of them as your social security number or your ID number, depending on which country you're from. And because they are unique, that's one of the reasons I hit, I hit my MAC address earlier when I was going into my router, because I did not want anyone seeing that, otherwise they're going to get up to some sort of shenanigans. So you were going to have to go to that printer, get its MAC address. It's up to you how you want to go and do that. There's probably like a million ways of doing it. And once you've done that, you can go click on add here. And then from that point forward, that IP being 120 will always be dished out to that same device over and over and over. All right, folks, so that is essentially DHCP for now. If you'd like to know more about that, I've added a link in the video description down below that will explain DHCP in a little bit greater detail for you guys. Um, quite frankly, I've added a lot of videos in the video description down below. Um, you'll see I'm going to give them a nice little title so that you can see um, which video is which video. So depending on what you want to know more about, you can just go and click on that relevant link and it's going to take you straight to that video on my channel. So if you want to know more about DHCP, this is a video about DHCP. If you want to know more about DNS, which is still coming up next, you can go and click on that link. So whatever you want to know more about that was in this video, if you want to know more about it in greater detail, you can just go click on that link. But what has been covered in this video and the, the amount that I've covered it in this video is enough for you to pass the exam. So if you're concerned about me adding videos in the video description, um, you know, when it comes to your exam, don't worry. What I've covered in this video is enough for you to pass the exam. What I've added in the video description is simply for those of you who'd like to know more. If you want to become a guru or if you're planning to study for the N plus exam or anything like that. So that is why I've added it there as a personal courtesy to you guys. So let's go back to that list of topics. Alrighty folks, here we are back on that list of topics. So I think before we go ahead and move on to the next topic, which is DNS, I think you guys could have guessed that because of what I just said. A few moments ago so we're gonna get to dns in just a moment but before we do that let me just quickly switch over to another virtual machine this one has got normal windows 10 installed on it the reason i want to do that is because i want to show you guys what it looks like when you go and configure an ip address and how or where you can go and do that and essentially you know how you can switch between static fixed and dynamic so let's quickly switch over to that windows 10 machine just a quick 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 one a few moments later 
All right, folks, here we are on that Wiener Stand machine I was just bragging about. So, there's many ways you can go about changing the IP. So, if you are on a Windows 10 or 11 machine, one way would be to go to the bottom right here next to your system clock. There's a little computer icon there. You can either right click on that, or if you're on a Wi Fi connection, it'll be a little Wi Fi boss icon there, and you can right click on that. If you're using a very old build of Windows 10, if you don't update your Windows, if you right click on that, you're going to see an option that says Network and Sharing Center. But on the newer builds of Windows 10 and 11, it doesn't say that anymore. It now says Open Network and Internet Settings. Now, you can actually still browse the Netflix and Sharing Center, which is pretty much what I'm going to do in a few moments. So you're going to have to do that by clicking there. Give it a moment or so. And this is going to essentially open what is known as the Settings app. Now, it's taking us to a very specific section in the Settings app. So if you were to go and open Settings app, this can be done by going to the bottom left here, clicking on Start. You click there on a the little gear icon where it says Settings. That is going to go open what is known as the Settings app. Now mine is already open on the settings app, but it's on a very specific section. More precisely, it is on the network and internet section, if you were to go and open the settings app. So it shows me when I'm on a Wi-Fi connection, wireless in other words, or Ethernet, in other words, cable. Today you can see I am on a cable connection. One of the ways you can go and change your IP address settings would be to go here to where it says Properties. And if you scroll down... You'll see it says IP settings. At the moment, it's on DHCP, which is the default. So that means this machine will automatically get an IP address every time it's turned on or connected to a network. If you want to go and change that, you can go here to where it says edit. You can change this to manual, IP version 4. And you can, of course, go and type in your IP address, your subnet, gateway, that kinds of stuff. I'm not going to click on OK, otherwise I'm going to disconnect this virtual machine because it's actually running online in the cloud. Let me go back one step here. Now there is another link there, it actually says Network and Sharing Center, so that's the old school way of doing things, if anyone still has access to that. If you go there, just one moment, it's going to show you once more if you're on a wireless connection or a wired connection. So currently it's a wired connection, I'm going to click there on Ethernet, Properties, IP version 4, Properties, and this is essentially the same thing, and this is actually the way we've been doing it for the last 10 or 20 years. So at the moment it's on what we call obtain an IP address automatically. That is the same as DHCP, folks. And if you go click there, now you or the user will have the ability to go and type this stuff in manually, which means it's fixed or static. It's going to stay like that until you or someone comes in here one day and come and change it manually. So I'm going to cancel this and I'm going to go back to that presentation of ours. So let me just leave this idling in the background in case we need it again later during the module. So let's go back to that list and go cover DNS. All right, here we are, folks. Domain name system. So I think it goes without saying that this is commonly known as DNS since that's all I've been saying the last few minutes. So it's commonly known as DNS. What is it and what does it do? It does a lot of things, but in a nutshell, it converts names to IP addresses and it converts IP addresses to names. Now that's a bit vague. I mean, that can mean a lot of things. So to give you guys an example, uh, if you were to go to something like a web browser, any web browser of your choice, and you go and type in www.youtube.com, did you know your machine does not actually know what that is or where that is? So as soon as you go and type in something like www.youtube.com, what your machine is going to go and do, at least the very first time it visits that website, it is going to go and contact something called the DNS. It's going to say, hey, listen, my bra, someone just typed in YouTube.com into the browser. I've got no idea what this is or where this is. Help me out. And the DNS is essentially going to go and look and look and look and look and look for what is called a record. It's got many kinds of records, but we're not going to focus on that today. That's N plus territory. It's going to go look for a record. You can think of this as going through the yellow pages in the old days, looking for someone's name or the last name, so you can go look up their phone number and see where they stay, that kind of stuff. So the DNS is going to go and look up a record, also very much the same as when you go to the doctor and they ask you what your name or your last name is, so they can go and pull your file, and when they pull your file, the doctor will know who he or she is dealing with, and then they can see what other... Um, things they've prescribed to you and what your medical history is and all that kinds of stuff. So they're basically not going in blind for lack of a better description. 
So the DNS will go and pull this record for YouTube.com. And when it pulls this record, it's going to see in that record what the IP address for YouTube.com is. So just like the doctor, when he or she pulls your record, they will see who you are. They're going to see your whole medical history and everything they need to know about you. If you've got any allergies, they will be able to see that. And then they know maybe not to go and prescribe certain kinds of medicine to you, obviously, right? So it's very much the same as those things. I know it's not identical, but I'm thumb sucking it. So I apologize. I'm winging it as I go along. So all of this that I just explained to you guys happens in the blink of an eye. So as soon as you hit the enter key on your keyboard, you know, obviously right after you typed in the address, within the blink of an eye, your machine does all of that. The DNS does all of what I've just explained. It tells your machine where YouTube is and what YouTube is. And then your machine proceeds to go to the IP address. You might not see it. You might not know it. But your machine is actually going to the IP address. Yes, folks. So in reality, what you could have actually have gone and done, most people probably don't notice is, you could actually go to your browser and instead of typing in the address of that website like youtube.com, you could actually go ahead and type in the IP address of that website. Believe it or not, that actually would have taken you to the website as well. Now, none of us, including myself, know what these IP addresses are. So for you to go and write down the IP address of every freaking website you want to visit in a day's time is just mental. We're not going to do that. This, I think the last time we did something similar was probably about 20 years ago when we used landline telephones and we wanted to go and call grandma or call a butcher or the pharmacist or the doctor. So back then there would be a phone in the house, you know, physically mounted to a physical telephone line. And that's the only phone we had back then. And if someone wanted to make a phone call, they would go and stand or sit next to this phone. There was possibly a book that they called the Yellow Pages next to that. If you want to go and look someone or something up. And maybe there was like a little black book or something where you would go and write people's names down and their telephone numbers, their landline numbers. So if you want to go and call grandma or an uncle or someone, you know, some loved one or someone important, you would go and look in that little bookie where you wrote down their names and their numbers and you would essentially go and call these people. So that's kind of like a DNS if you think about it. So if you had to go and imagine this now for a moment, imagine you had to go and type in the IP address for every website that you wanted to go and visit. Now it's possible you could go and write down all those IPs just like we used to go and write down all those phone numbers in the book. We could go and write down all these IP addresses in the book. But if you go and look at the fact that how many websites we go and visit, it's just not feasible. It's going to drive you nuts to go and do that. So instead, some clever bloke out there came up with this magical idea called DNS. And DNS takes care of all that inconvenience and heavy lifting for us. So all we need to do now is we just go and type in something very easy to remember, something very user-friendly like YouTube.com, Facebook.com, Twitter.com. That's all we need to do. That's very easy to remember. It's very easy to type in as a user or a human being. And when you do that, the DNA is going to go and take care of all the complicated, inconvenient stuff for us. So the DNA is going to go and say, okay, cool. What did you just type in? It's going to see you typed in Twitter.com. It's going to say, okay, cool. Let me look that up for you. It's going to go check what the record says for Twitter.com. It's going to show your machine what the IP address is for Twitter.com. And your machine will essentially go to, well, Twitter.com. So what can we say here? It resolves friendly names assigned to hosts to IP addresses. That's the technical term CompTIA says, but on its own, that's very freaking complicated. So I hope that my explanation has at least made a little bit more sense to you guys. Now, something you guys need to also be aware of is, let's say I invited you guys to my company, if I had a company. The very, very first day, if you needed to come to my company, let's say it was a training company where I train you the A plus course, the very first day, you would probably have no idea how to get there because, well, you've never been there. You're going to have to go and look up the address. You'll maybe call us. Uh, maybe you're going to send me an email. I'll tell you what the address is. You're probably going to end up punching it into a GPS. And on day one, you're going to use your GPS to navigate to my office, you know? So that is kind of like a DNS, for lack of a better description. Now on day two and day three and day four, are you going to go and use the, the GPS? Maybe, but probably not because, well, you've got something called short-term memory. You've been to my office at least once. 
and now because of something called short-term memory, you will remember how to get there. Now let's say after attending the A-plus course of me, six months or 12 months goes by, and then you decide to come back to me for the N-plus course. Now even though you've been to my offices before, you might not remember exactly how to get there because, well, it's been too long. Your short-term memory has forgotten. So what you could go and do then is just obviously go and ask for the address again, and then obviously day one, you're gonna use the GPS again, and then from day two, day three, and day four, and so on and so forth, you will no longer need it because of something called your short-term memory. Now, why the heck am I talking about memory the whole time here? What the heck does this have got to do with DNS? Well, it's got a lot to do with DNS, people. DNS works in the same way. So just like you that don't know how to get to my office on day one, your machine, your desktop, laptop, or whatever, does not know how to get to any website the very first time you want to visit that website. Let's say it's YouTube. So your machine is going to ask the DNS, hey, bro, where is YouTube.com? And YouTube.com will be given to you by the DNS. And now on day two and day three and day four, you might think your machine is asking the DNS where that is, but it's actually not. Your computer has got a short-term memory and that allows your machine to remember the websites you visited recently, just like your human short-term memory. So your machine is not going to go and ask the DNS where these websites are because it remembers where these websites are. And if enough time obviously passes by, it's going to eventually forget these websites if you have not visited them recently. And the very first time you visit those websites again, you know, after a very long period of time, it's going to go and ask the DNS again, how do I get to these sites? I have forgotten. Now, why am I spending so much time on this topic called DNS? Well, guys, because it's a question in your exam. It's not just a question in the exam. DNS is a PBQ in the exam. For those of you not familiar with PBQ, in case I have not mentioned it yet, but I'm fairly certain I've mentioned it somewhere in one of my modules, PBQ is short for performance-based question, also known as simulation. So in the exam, the average person will get about three practical simulations where you'll practically have to go and do something, and these count for a lot of marks. You can either lose a lot of marks or you can make a lot of marks. They're not very difficult, but if you don't understand them, you can, they can actually kind of catch you off guard. So the question in the exam, if you're unfortunate enough to get this question, is they will give you a command prompt window. And they're going to tell you, I can't remember exactly what the question said, but it's going to come down to you need to go and erase the computer's short-term memory when it comes to DNS. That is called your DNS cache. Your DNS cache is your computer's short-term memory as to which sites it has visited recently. So it's kind of like me clobbering you over the head and you having amnesia and you can't remember the last couple of days or couple of hours of what you've done. So you need to go and give your machine amnesia for lack of a better description. How do you do that? Well, guys, let me show you guys a quick command prompt window here. All right, folks, here we are on command prompt. So like I just said, you're going to be presented with a command prompt window in the exam. And all you need to do in the exam to get this question right is type in the correct command. And in reality, this could be anything. It could be a lot of commands, but you guys are lucky. It is just a one-line command. That is it. You're going to type the one-line command. You can hit the Enter key, and you're done. You're going to click on the next button. You're going to move on to the next question. So that is the good news. It's actually very easy. So I can't remember exactly what the question said, like I said earlier, but I do know it comes down to erasing your DNS cache. How do you do that? You type in ipconfig. There's a lot of commands that starts with ipconfig. And there's a lot of commands that's got a forward slash after that. So you're going to type forward slash, except now comes the unique part, which is uniquely going to go and erase the cache. That is flush DNS. That is the full command, guys. It is that. It is so short it is so straightforward, that's all you need to remember. So you're going to type ipconfig forward slash um, flush DNS, and that's going to go and erase your DNS cache. So will you still be able to browse? Absolutely, yes. Everything is going to work completely like normal. The only difference here is this computer on which I'm doing this on will not remember any of the websites that it's visited recently. So what's going to happen is I'm forcing this machine now to ask the DNS where these sites are. So in reality, to use the user or whoever the user is, nothing is going to look any different whatsoever 
every site will load perfectly normal, the same speed, everything will be normal. But in reality, in the background, it is very different because the machine is now actually asking the DNS in the background, where are these sites? Where are these sites? Because it's got no cooking clue where these websites are. That is a PPQ in the exam, and that counts for a lot of marks in the exam. So let's go back to our list of topics. All right, so we have just more or less covered DNA, so I think it's safe to move on to our next topic here, which is virtual LAN. So this is very commonly known as VLAN. Quite frankly, I don't know anyone that calls this virtual LAN. The only time I ever hear people saying that is in some sort of IT course like the one you guys are doing right now. Other than that, anyone that is anyone in IT will always refer to this as VLAN, but it obviously does mean it's a virtual LAN. So what is a VLAN? This is something that is configured on managed switches. You would remember earlier we spoke about switches. There's many kinds of switches you get. So you get hubs and switches. We're specifically talking about switches. We're specifically talking about a managed switch, not an unmanaged switch. A managed switch is a switch that's usually more expensive. And the reason that is, is because you can actually log on to the switch or log into it. You can go to a browser. That's one way to do it. You're going to type in the IP address of the switch, just like a router. You're going to log into the switch and you're going to go and configure the switch. How you do that and what you're going to go and do, I cannot tell you because it depends on the brand, it depends on the make, but quite often most of these switches are command based. So this could be something like a Cisco switch. It could be an HP switch. There's many, many, many brands, guys. The point is, once you or the technician logs into the switch, he or she will essentially have the power to go and configure or create, more importantly, what is known as a VLAN. Now, what a lot of people, people don't know is actually all switches, even the dumb ones, the ones that's just unmanaged, even they actually have a VLAN on them by default. This is called VLAN 1. So that means all the ports on that switch are on the same network, which you might think, okay, well, duh, that is obvious. Not necessarily, because if you look at a managed switch, just because all the ports are physically on the same switch, that does not mean they are the same network. So if I plug my computer's cable into that switch, and one of you guys are going to plug your network cable into that same switch, you might think we're on the same network, but that is not necessarily the case when it comes to a managed switch. We could very well be on two very different networks because of the VLAN factor. So if it's an unmanaged switch, there's only one VLAN. It's called VLAN 1. That means everybody is physically and logically on the same network. Now, looking at this from a managed switch perspective, some technician like us can log in there and we can go and create more VLANs other than VLAN 1. So I can go and say, if this is a, let's say this is a 16 port switch, I can go and say port 1 all the way through to port 8 will be VLAN 1, so in other words, the default, and port 9 all the way through to port 16 will be VLAN 2. So physically, all of these 16 ports are on the same switch, but logically, they're not the same network. So if me and one of you guys plug into any of the ports between 8 and, and 1, or 1 and 8, we will be on the same network. But uh, let's say I go and plug my cable out, and I plug myself in between something between 9 and 16. So you guys are something between 1 and 8. I plug into the very same switch, but something between 9 and 16. We will not be on the same network. We will not be able to find each other on the network, digitally speaking. So physically, we're using the same physical infrastructure, the same physical switches on our network, same physical cables. There's no extra switches, no extra cables, no extra any hardware, really. But, logically, you have just created extra networks, digitally speaking. So this is a very cool way for us to create extra networks within our network without having to go and, while well, putting extra cables in the walls or the ceilings and add additional switches and that kinds of stuff because that's going to be a lot of work. Nobody wants to go and do that. It's a lot of maintenance and it's very, very expensive and very, very time consuming. So it saves us on costs, it saves us on time, and quite frankly, just the inconvenience of it all. So I can go and put myself on two different networks. Uh, you'll find a lot of companies does this. I would say pretty much all medium to large size companies does this. The reasons they do that is completely unique to every company. I've seen some companies will go and use these virtual networks for different types of traffic. You'll find VLAN 1 might be for desktops and laptops. 
VLAN 2 might be for VoIP traffic, so that's telephones and stuff. VLAN 3 and VLAN 4 might be for other kinds of traffic. So depending on the kind of traffic, that might determine how many VLANs you've got and what they are and all that kinds of stuff. Um, this could also just be a matter of I want to divide people. And if I've got an example, I've got two switches and both of these two switches each have two VLANs. So switch one has got VLAN 1, VLAN 2. Switch 2 has got VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. So if I were to go and plug myself into VLAN 2 on switch 1 and you plug yourself into VLAN 2 on switch 2, even though we are plugged into two different switches, as long as we are plugged into the same VLAN, folks, we can communicate. It's as if we've plugged into the, the same switch when we talked about the old unmanaged switches. So somewhere along the line, as long as these networks are physically connected and as long as we are on the same VLAN, communication would occur. But if we're not on the same VLAN, you can forget about it. So what can we say here? Subdivides networks into more logical networks, but remains the same amount of physical equipment. So like I said earlier, you're not going to use any extra additional physical equipment, no extra cables, switches or what have you. You're going to use the exact same equipment. Only difference is some Joe like you or me is going to log into one of these managed switches and we're going to go and configure it and we're going to go and create additional VLANs. And once you've created a VLAN, you actually have the power to go and choose exactly which ports you want on that VLAN. Pretty nifty, right? Okay, folks, and here is the very last topic for this module, virtual private network commonly known as VPN. I think everybody's heard of a VPN. So VPN, and you probably know this part already, allows remote connectivity to places like the office. It was originally designed for that with in mind. So originally it was designed so that people can go home for whatever reason and connect to the office safely, which brings us to this point. It's a secure encrypted connection. Why do we need it to be encrypted? Because when you or someone connect from home or wherever you're doing this from to the office, what infrastructure are you or the user going to go and use? Well, you're going to have to make use of the internet, folks. And since we know everybody's got access to the internet, that means anyone and his uncle could potentially hack you, hijack your session. I mean, what's happening? If you're not getting hijacked at your local traffic light, you're getting hijacked online these days. It's just insane what the world is coming to. So, because of all that security, you know, concerns, this connection is encrypted. Yep, encrypted. And when you go and use this connection to go and remote connect to wherever it might be, let's say to the office, you can think of this as digitally teleporting yourself somewhere where you're not. It's not something that's in the course. I'm adding that as an extra for you guys. It's a nice way of explaining it. So, physically, you might be sitting at home. You might be on your own, own internet connection at home, on your own laptop at home, and when you VPN to the office or wherever it is you're VPNing to, it's as if you are there, digitally speaking. Anything you could normally do while you were there, you can now do. But it is also a double-edged sword. Anything you could normally not do when you were there, that also applies, folks. So if you could normally, let's say, not access YouTube or Facebook while you're at the office, because that's something a lot of companies don't allow this to have to do, as soon as you VP into the office, it's as if you're at the office. So all policies and rules and procedures get forced down upon you, good and bad, including the ones that block you from certain websites. So when you try and access Facebook or YouTube while VP into the office, you're going to notice, even though you're on your internet and your device, it's not going to work. You will have to go and disconnect from that VPN connection first before you'll be able to go and access your personal nonsense, whatever that might be. Pretty cool, right? So um, I think that is pretty much all I need to explain to you guys. But just to emphasize on VPN a little bit extra here, you know, since we are pretty much done with this module, let me give you guys a blank window here. And I'm going to draw something for you guys. Just humor me. I'm trying something new with one of these videos. So I'm going to draw a little black, well, not black, white block here. There's a bit of a white block there. Why am I drawing a white block there? Because, well, that's going to symbolize your office. So I'm going to write it there. I'm going to go and say office. And that could also be seen as on premises. Let me type that there for you guys. Let me just drag that a little bit to the right. So this is the office. It's on premises. And at the office, we've got a couple of users. There's one. 
there's two, there's three, and there is four. So I've got a couple of users in the office. In reality, we know this is not up to scale. This is probably going to be a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand people in the office. But that is what we've got. Imagine these circles as being laptops or desktops at the office. And imagine there's a little square at the top right hand side there as being some sort of server or servers. Let's just go and add that there. So that's some sort of server or servers at the office. Now, this little bloke there, that little piggy there, that could be you. Now, normally, if that's you and you're at the office, in the office building, you can go and access any of your colleagues, no problemo. You can access the server, no problemo. Why is that? Because you are in the same building and you are on the same network. Whether it's wired or wireless, it doesn't matter. You're in the same building on the same network. Now, imagine now there's another building here on the left. That is your home. I'm going to add a little title there, guys. Let's call that home. It could be anywhere. This could be a local coffee shop. And you're working from home now. Why that is, I don't know. Maybe you've got COVID-19 and your company policy is you've got to work from home until you're clear. Maybe, well, you just decide to work from home because half the people are working from home these days. If you want to work from home, can you contact your, your fellow colleagues or the server that you just contacted? No, you cannot. That's a different network, guys. Your home network is a different network. So how do I get myself to the internet? So, oh, well, not to the internet, to the office. I'm going to go and use the internet as my medium. So let's go and add a little poofy cloud here. I know it's not up to scale, but we can imagine that cloud there being the internet as we know it. So I need to get my butt into the office. I'm going to go and VPN to the office through that cloud. So that cloud is the internet. I'm using the VPN connection to go through the internet safely and securely. So when, as soon as I go for the internet, you can imagine yourself going through like a little tunnel there. There's a little tunnel. I wish I could take credit for that, but that's not something I can take credit for. Any manual you grab, A+, plus, N+, plus, from any vendor or whatever, they always show you some sort of cloud picture with some sort of tube. And um, I think that basically just symbolized the concept of encryption. You can imagine yourself being in a little pipe or a little tube when you go for the internet. And anyone as anyone that's on the internet cannot penetrate that pipe or that tube. It's kind of like those tunnels that goes underneath, you know, rivers and oceans and stuff. I think in Europe, for those of you that's from Europe, they've got these pretty cool tunnels that, you know, basically links one island to another or one section, you know, to another section. You've got to go and drive underneath a riverbed or something. Really, really cool engineering. I think you can find a couple of videos about that on YouTube or Discovery Channel. And essentially here, the, the point I'm trying to make is cars that go into the tunnel from the one side, they will eventually come out the other side unscathed and completely bone dry not a drop on them. The water from that river or that ocean or that lake, that is unable to penetrate that tunnel. That water could basically be seen as everybody on the internet. So just like that water that's not able to penetrate that tunnel where the cars are driving through, I know I'm just making it up, it's not my best example, but hey. So just like that, this tunnel you're going through on the internet, usually speaking, can kind of be seen as that. You are in a safe encrypted tunnel and anyone that tries to hijack you or see what you're doing, you know, they're not going to be able to get anything or see anything because, well, it's encrypted, folks. So now when you VP into the office, besides what I just said, now I, I am basically the office. You can see where I am at the office now. Everything I could normally do while I'm in the office, I can do that. Anything I could normally not do while I was in the office, I will not be able to do. So any good rules and bad rules will be forced down to me. So there's a bad rule that gets forced down upon me. And there is a good rule that gets forced down upon me. Good rules would be something like a server. If I wanted to gain access to a certain server, I will have access to that server now because it's as if I'm at the office. Uh, a bad you know, rule or something would probably be the fact that I cannot access certain things either, you know, like Facebook and YouTube and that kinds of stuff. So I hope this makes a little bit more sense to you folks, what a VPN connection is. You are essentially teleporting yourself somewhere where you're not safely and securely. And if anyone at that remote location tries to trace you, you know, in case you're wondering about that, because I've had questions about that, no, they cannot trace you and they will not know where you are, folks. So yeah, guys, please let me know in the comment section down below what you think about the drawing thing. Should I do more of that as something new I'm doing? That's actually the very, very, very first time I've done that in any video on this channel. So I'm trying something new. 
if you guys find that interesting, if that works for you guys, because that's actually what I do in real life when I train these courses. I'm a professional trainer in real life, and then I actually do draw. Um, but it's a bit difficult to do this kinds of stuff in videos, you know, on YouTube. But if you guys find it interesting, if it helps you guys to understand the topics a little bit more, if, if I draw, please let me know in the comment section down below. Yes, that works. It makes it easier to understand. Or no, please don't do that again. It sucks. Or, you know, I, I, I'm not going to know unless you guys tell me. So if... If I find you guys like it or you enjoy it or it works, then I'll do more of it. If it doesn't work, you guys, then I'll stop it. You know, so yeah, I need your feedback to know if it's working or not. On that note, guys, we are actually done at this specific module. Don't disappear just yet. If you have enjoyed this video, including my drawing, please give the video a like, please. And if you'd like to know if module six comes out, like usual, subscribe. And then the usual thank you to all my sponsors. Guys, thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. I really do appreciate it. So that is everyone. From the Patreon and PayPal sponsors to those of you that's been clicking on the thanks button. And including those of you that has just been buying me a coffee or a milkshake. And yes, I did end up giving it to my kids. So and I did say I would. So if any of you guys would like to sponsor me as well, you can find that information in the video description down below. You can see there it is, the list of Patreon sponsors and PayPal sponsors currently. The, the list is growing and growing. Um, and like I've said before, and I'll say it again, if you guys are going to buy me a coffee or a milkshake, I'm probably going to end up spending it on milkshake on my kit. But either way, it goes to a good cause. So, yeah, there is that. All right, guys, that is me. I shall talk to you guys again on Module 6. What is next? Module 6. Yeah, Module 6. We'll talk again on Module 6. Have a nice one, guys.